Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank God for all of you joining us. Um, I see the saints uh, coming in, and we thank God just to have all of you. I want to personally thank Deacon Preston for taking the time and doing the research um, on this subject to uh, bring it to you with clarity and understanding. We have been taking our time with it, not trying to rush through it. The Lord said the same this Friday. We're going to come in and, and for the Lord's um, for Passover, for the Lord's uh, communion of his, his blood and his body. And I hope you have a better understanding of these things. And let me also say, you can press it out. We don't have a lock and key on Passover Feast of Unleavened Bread. But we've, we've worked on it and tried to uh, come up and see what does the Lord say? What does the scripture say? And uh, we, have, so we said this often. We have people, even with our own church organization, who observes observe a little different. I'm just grateful we all observe pass on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When they come in, what they do and how they end it may, may differ from uh, in the church to church, pastor to pastor a little bit, but um, I don't get hung up on that and I don't fight people. I don't, but I try to be a defender of, of what we believe and how we present it. Uh, I'm open. I know Deacon Preston and our conversation, we're both open to uh, anything you bring, if, if we may not have what clarity, we want to give clarity. And if you bring something that we have not thought about, we'll take a look at it. So don't feel like, well, if, if, if Apostle Radcliffe said it or Deacon Preston said it, it has to be done. No, we are we are in a, in a posture of learning and a posture of, of under, getting the understanding of what thus says the Lord and what the Lord desired from us as people. So um, I don't want you to say it, my pastor said or Deacon Preston said, I want you to say, it, I understand what the words say. And if we say something that the word doesn't say, then it's okay for you to say, it. well, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I think I got it. But when I read this, I was confused. All right, so this this winds down. This is the fifth part of the, um, of this five part series, fifth and final part. Yes, we have Sabbath school lessons and whatnot in other conversations continuously, but this is the last lesson before we go into the feast. So, with that being said, I'm going to give you over to Deacon Preston, and he was he would uh, lead the discussion. Hey Amen. So again, I, I want to. I want to thank all of you for your engagement and conversation that we've had around the topics. And so I, I will go through a quick recap. But Apostle and I were talking about this topic. And, and I want you to think about this. Uh, one of the things he mentioned to me that I, I was not aware of, if you go back in the House of God's history to our 1938 uh, minutes, uh, the minutes from the meeting, probably the number one topic was the Passover. And, and who did what on this day and that day. And so this issue has been around for us a long period of time. And, and I will say this, I really respect the Apostle Ragland's position on it uh, because again, there may be things that we look at in the scripture that he and I may not see eye to eye on. That's right. But the thing that I really appreciate is he's never condemned people that keep it a different way. Uh, I will say this, and I love my brothers and sisters in the house of God, I've been in services where you have, I've been openly condemned for keeping it a different way. And so as we and go- very passionate, passionate. And very, very passionate about it. And I respect the passion, but as we go through it tonight, we want to give you clarity. And so what I would do is when we started out on this journey, I want you to think about if you didn't have a good understanding about Easter, we talked about Easter man-made or God-given. We got you clear. We, uh, hopefully, we gave you clarity where you sh where we showed you while Easter's mentioned in the scripture in Acts chapter twelve, verse four. That's really the translation, Pesha, meaning Passover. So it was during the time of the Passover, and so we wanted to give you clarity on that. We wanted to give you clarity on three days and three nights, and we tackled that in our last conversation. And so tonight, what we really want to do is talk through um, the count and, and make sure we get a good understanding on that piece. Now, what I will say is you go through the scripture. So if you look in Leviticus, sometimes you can look in, you know, if you look in Leviticus 23, if you look in Exodus 12, if you look in Numbers chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter 16, you'll see different things around the days of unleavened bread. And so what I want to do today is I typically do, I'll just share some information with you just to make sure we have clarity on how, 
how we get to where we are on this, and then we'll just go through it and make sure if you've got any questions um, that you would ask your questions. So what I always like for us to anchor to is this. What does it say? Again, what's our observation as we look at the scripture? What does it mean? What's that interpretation that we have of God's word? And then to me, what's most important? What does it mean to me? What is that application? And so when we think about this, and this is just a recap, I genuinely believe when you look at this season, one of the things I would say and make sure we take away from this is, uh, one, Jesus was sacrificed for our sins. And that is, that is mission critical. So uh, if you don't take two things, I'd say really take away from everything that we've talked about. Jesus was sacrificed for our sins. Uh, what the Lamb did for Israel during the Passover, Jesus did for all humankind. And, I, and we went over these scriptures the last time. And then if you know me, the thing I'm, and I am extremely passionate about is the resurrection of Jesus. And so when I read uh, literature and uh, when I read uh, books written by atheists, uh, I, I like to read those types of books because I want to understand what's their position, what's their view. But even the most ardent atheist will say, if the resurrection of Jesus is true, then all of his other truth claims, I've got to believe those too. Uh, and so when you look at it, when you look at the tangible proof that we have from that, uh, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when you look at historical texts, when you look at all that, Jesus rose from the dead. And to me, this is the linchpin on what we believe, why we believe, why we can be anchored in our faith that what Jesus said in the word is true. As a side note, when you think about it, when the early writers, when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were writing their letters, they did not realize they were writing the Bible or something that would be included in the Bible. They were actually just writing letters. I think that is so important. And sometimes we miss that because they are writing letters about what? They're writing letters about somebody who was really um, Joseph's son, the carpenter's son, uh, a rabbi that probably never traveled more than 50 miles from where he was born and raised. Why did they write about him? They wrote about him um, because there were a lot of people in that day and time who, who said they were messiahs, who said they were all this, but it was only Jesus who got up from the dead. That's why they wrote about him. And if you go to Luke chapter one, Luke begins with, uh, many people have tried to write an orderly account of this. And I, all I'm trying to do is give you an orderly account of all the things that Jesus did. And so I think that's really important. And so Jesus actually rose from the dead. Now, again, I wanted to make sure we understood this, and I'm not going to go through this the entire time, but I wanted to make sure we understood some things from the Old Testament Passover to Jesus being our Passover. We talked about the blood of the lamb. We talked about the blood of Jesus. We talked about the lamb in the Old Testament was a lamb without spot or blemish. We know we took that lamb on the 10th day of Abib up until the 14th day of Eve. They killed the lamb, Jesus. Pilate said it himself. He said, I don't find any fault in this man. And so even Peter says, it's the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without spot or blemish, without blemish or spot. Um, Exodus 12 and 46, I think this was really interesting. Uh, the lamb, you couldn't break a bone with that lamb. Same thing with Jesus. And he fulfilled the scripture in Psalms 34 and 20. And then finally, he executed judgment, not only on Egypt, but of the gods of Egypt. And that's the same thing Christ did when he was crucified. So just I wanted to just give you a quick overview on those things. We talked about the timing last time when Jesus was actually crucified. When we look at the scriptures, we talked about the third hour being approximately nine in the morning. We talked about the sixth hour being at 12 o'clock. The thing I think I would have you take away from that is at the brightest part of the day where the sun is at its peak is actually when darkness covered the earth. So uh, even the earth recognized the significance of Jesus' crucifixion. And then around three o'clock, we know that Jesus uh, died on the cross. And from that time period, from three o'clock until the sun going down, we knew, or as we look at the scripture, because it was coming into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they had to beg his body off the cross so they could actually put 
his body into the tomb because again, they couldn't, you know, they, they had to make sure his body was in the tomb before the Sabbath came in. And so again, just quick overview on those several topics and apostle, before we jump into our main topic tonight, I wanted to, in that overview, ask, was there anything you wanted to point out or to the class? Is there anything you need clarity on that we went over um, last time and as we did that quick overview tonight? You can press the first of all, I think you got a great job with the overview. I think uh, we are both waiting to hear from the listeners to see, you know, what they say, I got it. I didn't get it. Go back to that slide. Can we talk about that some more? So any questions? All right. So we're going to jump back. And so when we think about this right here, let's think about the timing. And so uh, when was the Passover? Uh, so when did they kill the Passover? And what's the time on this? So let's think about this. So we know when we look at the scripture, like I said, when you look at Exodus chapter 12, Leviticus 23, um, Deuteronomy chapter 16, Numbers chapter 28, you'll see the Passover was killed on the 14th day at even. Uh, and then when you look at it, Deuteronomy 16 and 6 will tell you when the evening actually is. But again, the, the conversation, and I like to call it that, the conversation will be, well, was it at the beginning of the 14th or was it at the end of the 14th? And we'll talk about that. But when you think about the timing, lamb was taken on the 10th day of the month. It was kept until the 14th day of Eve when it was sacrificed. And then the 15th day actually begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so the 15th day will begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We're supposed to keep that. Um, it says seven days we shall eat unleavened bread. We know in the first day shall be a holy convocation. We shall do no work. We shall do no servile work therein. So when we think about that piece, that's what we've got as far as the timing of the event is concerned. So the reality is when we think about the Passover, when we think about the timing of the Passover, like I said earlier, there are some that keep it who will say the Passover was killed um, at the very beginning of the 14th day. There are some that will say it was killed at the very end of the 14th day. I genuinely believe when you look at the scripture, I can see how people can get their viewpoint. I respect their viewpoint. Uh, I will say this. From my reading of the scripture, I will always believe that the 14th day is the Passover. And the reason I want to bring that up is there are some people, uh, and, and you will hear uh, for those of you who remember Apostle Randolph Ragland, he shared about a pastor's conference where there were some who were actually moving really towards not even recognizing the 14th day and really just saying it was the 15th day on. I'm a believer that the 14th day is the Passover. And then from the 14th day, we go into the 15th day. That 15th day is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we eat unleavened bread seven days. Let me say this, and then I'll put it in apostles' hands. When you look at some of the scriptures um, after uh, really Deuteronomy, uh, the first five books, and you go into the period after um, in their exile or even into the New Testament, uh, typically Passover and Unleavened Bread were separate festivals, but over time they actually got blended. So you will see in the New Testament, especially, they will say the days of unleavened bread where the Passover was killed. Or you could read something where it was like the Passover, a feast for seven days. And so over time, they got blended together. So I wanted just to point that out. So, Apostle, you and I had this conversation, and I want us to just talk through it around the timing. So when you think about the timing of the, the the Passover, what's your view on that that you want to make sure we understand as a congregation? And I'm glad you said, Dick President, as a congregation, because first of all, you and I have talked, I am so grateful this year that we got people who are looking at Passover, who are observing Passover, um, and I don't want them to get caught up in the semantics of uh, what time of day was this, what time of day was that. You are so right in saying that the 14th day is the Lord's Passover. Very simple. There's one verse in um, Leviticus uh, 
23. It just said, you know, uh, and five. In the 14th day of the first month at Eve is the Lord's Passover. Plain and simple, right? Leviticus 23 and five. That's where I anchor the 14th day. But then I understand you look through the scriptures and even in, um, in, in the New Testament scriptures, where it said, where should we go to eat the Passover? I am of the mindset that the Passover was a meal. Jesus ate the Passover, his disciples, on the 14th day, what I call the dark of the 14th day, knowing that evening and morning was the day. Um, so I'm looking at the, at the beginning of the 14th day, they ate the Passover because um, they were given the instruction, eat it, stay in your homes, don't come out. So they ate it and they stayed in and then and later in the night on the 14th, um, Pharaoh took note that his firstborn was dead. The, the, the cry had gone out and he summons Moses. So Moses and Aaron goes to Pharaoh and said, uh, Pharaoh said, get him out of here. So all this on the 14th day. So what I see, and that's why we recognize the 14th day is so important. Do I see it as a, as a Sabbath that had the restrictions of you can't do this, you can't do that? No. Why was that done? God in his infinite wisdom knew that if he had restricted Passover uh, to a, a, a feast day that they could not do anything on, they wouldn't have been able to crucify Christ. And how could they crucify, how could Christ become our Passover if he was not crucified on Passover? So that for me, that, that's kind of those things that anchor all of this for me. And I look at it and I say, all right, 14th day, Passover. Whatever happened, there had been a meal. Jesus ate the Passover, his disciples. In that same 24-hour period before the sundown on the 15th, he became the Passover. And you just pointed out uh, those times and what happened at um, on the third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour. Right. Those times were, were very important. But that's when Jesus became our Passover. When he became our Passover, they got his body off the cross. Why? Because the high Sabbath was coming in, or that day was considered a high day. That day was one of the feast days that you couldn't work, you couldn't do, you couldn't do any survival work, you couldn't do um things, and they had to get his body off the cross. It was being, it would have been um uh, disrespectful to leave his body on the cross on that high Sabbath. Yeah, so Apostle, I want to touch on that, your point, and then I'll open it up for questions. Because again, uh, when we think about th there will be people that will keep the 14th as a Sabbath, they'll keep the 15th as a Sabbath, right. they'll keep the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread as a Sabbath. But even in our own church history, uh, we, we used to do that. Right. Right, from that standpoint. So we used to, it would be, we would keep the 14th as a Sabbath, 15th as a Sabbath, and the last day. But now, as you said, and I, I like the point that you brought up, with all the things that had to happen on the 14th day, um, you know, really, and then thinking about Jesus being crucified and becoming our Passover, um, our, our understanding at this point is that the 14th day was not a Sabbath day, but the 15th day is a Sabbath, and the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a Sabbath. So again, just want to stop right there, because again, um, I'd say this, there are people on this call that are at different levels with where you are at the Passover. We want to make sure we give as much clarity as possible. So I'll stop there. Are there any questions for me or Apostle around the timing, and, and do you do you get the understanding of it? What clarity do you need? Was this done in April or or another month? Good question, Fleet. We have to look at, we are talking, when we say Abib and whatnot, we're talking about a Hebrew calendar. Now, the month of, of Abib mm -hmm. can overlap between March, April. Um, mm -hmm. So Abib 14th and April the 14th are not the same day. Um, this year, they're very close they in days, but not exact. So, yeah, good question. Um, when you're talking about biblical time, you cannot look at all the days that are spelled out in Leviticus chapter 23 according to the Hebrew calendar or the Jewish calendar. Um, our calendar is called a, a Gregorian calendar. Emperor Gregory um, was the one that designed our calendar. So we have to know how to count 
had a must compare. Really good okay. question. Good question. What other questions? Other than that, yesterday, there was a time that we didn't have access to the mm. uh, Hebrew calendar. We kept, I remember as a young child, we kept the Passover April the 14th to April the 21st. <laughs> wow. We, okay. didn't know, we didn't have anything else to go by. Good question. Any other questions? Mm. All right. If you've got questions, I encourage you to put those in the chat or come off mute because we want to talk about we want to talk about that. But here's the thing I want to spend the bulk of our time on. And, and Apostle, I heard you say from from your perspective with the Passover, you believe Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples. Uh, he became the Passover for us. I, I want to spend the bulk of our time on that. And then if people have questions, um, I want to answer those questions. We've got two questions that people have emailed to us. And I want to make sure at the very end we answer those questions around uh, what those individuals asked us so they could get clarity on it. And so, Apostle, when, when we think about this piece here, before we jump to Luke chapter 22, um, in your mind, when we take the body and the blood, uh, when we take, you know, we take, uh, we'll eat the unleavened bread, we'll drink the water, from your viewpoint and understanding, do you see that becoming the actual body and blood of Jesus? And the reason I want to do that, we're going to jump into Luke chapter 22. I want to make sure people have a, an understanding of that. So what's your view on that? You know, people years ago and even today, I hear people said, this represent his body or this represent his blood. The scripture doesn't say that. When Jesus gave it to his disciples, where you're going to in a few minutes, he said, take, eat. This is my body. And I tell you, um, being a pastor, and even when I was a, um, the co-pastor and doing the uh, communion, we, you know, we don't break off so many matzah pieces as to, as to the number of people we have in the congregation. We break off and hopefully we have enough broken that uh, when we pass it around, everybody have a piece. We don't have to re-break anymore because I, I want to make sure you have a little extra. My problem was, I have this extra bread. What do I do with it? I don't want to throw it out. I, I, I'm not going to throw it in the trash. Um, what do I do? I didn't want to just throw it out for the birds. What do I do? And I remember some years ago, right after, shortly after, maybe a month after Passover, I'm at, um, we had Bishop Cordery's church in Louisville. Sitting in his office, there was a um, saran wrap. They had a, a, a stack of broken monsters in it and it was sitting on his desk and I laughed and I said to him I see you don't know what to do with it either because if it's the blood if it's the body of Christ that the, the cup I had no problem with that I finished that off I drank good thing it wasn't wine I drank all of it but um but the bread I'm looking at this and go what do I do and the Lord just laid it in my spirit to say it is what is ingested what we take in our bodies is his body that what is left over go back to being matzah and, and what was in the cup. So, Apostle, why is that so significant? And again, I think a lot of times we may not even think about it, but what I heard you say is we believe it actually is the body and the blood of Jesus. So when we are a part of that ceremony this coming week, the significance of that is when we come there, it is the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. And so when we when we think about that, and, and again, I go back to the Sabbath school lesson where you, you know, you came out uh, <laughs> with a pretty strong position on your thoughts on uh, making sure that when people come, they understand the ceremony that they're partaking in. Because again, when we looked at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I believe we talked through that a little bit. And so your view is this is the actual body and blood. Is that correct? Yes. All yes. Right. And I, I believe there's not a substitute. I believe, you know, we serve a God that worked miracles. We, we serve a God that can do anything. If he says it's my body, then his body. All right. Like, so I, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I see Sister Karen's question, and we want to get to that because we're going to go, go to Luke. And so I would encourage you, if you've got your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> And that's what we're going to take a look at tonight. Uh, if you go to Luke chapter 22, and we're going to begin at verse 7. 
Now, remember I said earlier, over time, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread actually, um, you know, were, were really seen synonymous as just one, where in, in, in most of the Old Testament scriptures, it's seen as separate festivals. Uh, but again, when we look at this scripture, you'll see where it's like it was the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. So you again, know, Preston, before that, even today, we don't say we're in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We, we recognize we the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but in that conversation, we said what? I'm in the Passover. That's right. We could be three or four days into it, and we'll say, I'm in the Passover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so I want us to understand that component. So now let's look in the scripture, because I want to make sure we understand this, and we want to answer the question around the two cups. And so Luke chapter 22, verse 7, um, at the beginning of verse 7, it says, Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall be a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entered in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, the master said unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found as, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, with desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup. And gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So, Apostle, our prophet Richardson asked the question, explain the first and second cup. So as we look at this here, we have this situation. Uh, we see this first cup, and we he did, after that first cup, it looks like um, he goes in, and there's bread, and then there's another cup. So can you walk us through, for, for all of us to have a better understanding, what was happening right there? Now, there's a, a several things I want to cover in this passage. Uh-huh. First of all, um, they sit down to eat the pastor. The pastor's been prepared. Now they're sitting down eating it. And, and now while they're eating it, and as it's getting closer to the end of the Passover meal, he says this, with desire, this is back to your verse 15 in uh, Luke 22, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you, what, before I suffer. I know my hours come. I know my time is up. They didn't know it, but he said, before I suffer. It's amazing to me they didn't question him on what he said. So he said, for I say unto you, I will not eat thereof in him, uh, until it be fulfilled with you in fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now what that says, Passover will be observed in the kingdom. Because he said, what? I'm not going to eat it anymore until it be fulfilled. Now, is it going to be fulfilled by eating it or is it going to be fulfilled just by him being in the kingdom, or by us being in the kingdom. That's a question that would, would beg a whole lot of um, questions, and I'm not, I don't want to get into that part tonight, but that this does imply that there will be something about Passover in the new kingdom, right? And this is what he says in, in verse 17. He took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. It didn't say he took part, took of it. He said to the 12, y'all divide among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Whatever the fruit of the vine was, whatever was in that, this is, this is the first cup, right? Whatever was in this cup, it was what they were drinking with the Passover meal, what we call the Seder meal. I don't know what it was, but if it, if it was just, just um, fruit juice. He said, I'm not drinking it anymore. 
what that tell me? After his resurrection and those 40 days uh, or, or so that he was seen a man, he never drank it again. He never drank the fruit of the vine again. I didn't think about that until the day I was doing some thought. But he said, he said I'm not going to drink it, whatever it was. He may have drank it before with them, but he said, I'm not going to drink it till I drink it um, with you in the kingdom, right? Uh, that's, that is verse, verse 18 is telling us that. Verse 19 said, he took bread and gave thanks. Now before this, between verse 18 and 19, just get this image in your mind. The meal was over. The Seder meal, the Passover meal was over. Now, it doesn't, the scripture doesn't say they cleared off the table, but for your visual, imagine that one of the disciples came and picked up everything on the table and nothing was left but a cup and bread. That's not where it played out, I don't believe, but I'm just saying for us, for our understanding. What was in the first cup? Pushed aside. Even though he blessed it, it was pushed aside. And him blessing it may have been something that confused people. Because it says here he blessed it. Now, when you go to uh, Matthew 26 and 26, it's, it, it doesn't talk about two cups. Uh, two, it tells me he took the cup. He took the bread first in Matthew 26 and 26. He took the bread. He blessed it and said, eat it. Then he took the cup and he blessed it and said, drink it. In Luke 22, he took a cup, blessed it, said, divide among yourselves, Right? And now in verse 19, he took the bread, gave thanks, break it, gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. He's given them a command as going forward. I want you to do this. And when you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Where was he at the Passover? How often was Passover kept? Once a year. So it, it, didn't, it doesn't mean that Every month you do it, people do that. But according to the scripture, he just said, when you come together to do this, do this in remembrance of me. All right? Because this is my, this is now not the body of the lamb. We had the lamb a few minutes ago. It was Jesus saying, right? We had the lamb, but I'm implementing what we call the communion, what we call Holy Communion. He gave mm -hmm. the, the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you, do in remembrance of me. And verse 20, likewise, also the cup after supper. You see cup one, verse 17, mm -hmm. and you see another cup. Likewise, the cup after saying what? And he makes a distinction in this statement. He says, well, this cup, now they already had one cup, they divided, but he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shared for you. All right, and then we don't know what was in the cup until after he was crucified. Because he said, this cup in the New Testament in my blood. Well, his blood had not been shed at this point. So there was no question, there was no comment about what was in the cup at this point. The first cup, it said, was the fruit of the divine. This cup, it mm -hmm. said, this is what's in my blood. We don't know until after this when we get to St. John 19 and 34, and it talks about when that soldier came along with the spear, and the custom, the custom was that when they crucify somebody, they would break the legs. And I think you explained it last week or two that they did that so they would not be able to rest their legs um, on that crossbar, whatever it was, so they could relieve the pressure. They broke the legs so they wouldn't be able to, to kind of lift themselves up while they're doing the crucifixion, but they looked up at Jesus and they said, the soldier said he's already dead. Remember he said, uh, that, uh, uh, what they said, uh, when he was saying that, and he gave up the ghost. He dropped his head and locked on his shoulder, gave up the ghost. So when he gave up the ghost, what it mean? He, he was dead by their account. So the soldier come by, what am I going to do to this man who's already dead? I, no, no use me breaking his legs, but the Holy Ghost caused that man with that spear to pierce him in his side. And when he pierced him in his side, what came out? Blood and water. And this is the thing. 
you had to know for, for that to have been recorded, it had to have been a visible stream of blood and a visible stream of water. So there you go with your two cups and um, uh, I hope that help people understand. If you don't understand this two cups, how we see the two cups in this passage of scripture, please ask, because this is one of the things that, that the religious world, the Christian world really get hung up on is the cup. Or if anybody got a little bit more to add to it and feel you can give more clarity. I'm, um, I'm Pastor. Yes. Hi, good, good evening. Good evening, everyone. How y'all doing? Hey, Brother Jones. All hey. right. My question is, when um, when they said, like we said, the blood and water came out, now that you talk about the cups, I'm thinking that the blood could not be used because the blood had sin in it. The water was the purifier. So that's why now in the second cup, the water is, is, is the purifier of Christ. Whereas well, that's true, and, and that's a good analogy, but this is the thing. You, when you look at the history, they were forbidden for eating blood. They okay. could not have eaten blood. Right, because I, I was saying, because we, we got our blood flowing through us and, and, and it's sinful because we are the human. And now that you're saying the water, when you said the water came through, I'm thinking that's what it, that's why the water came because the water was to purify. It. And it, you it, know, it, I, it, I, I can go along with that. That's, that's not stated as part of uh, the purpose of it. Purpose, and, okay. Yes, but, it, but you make a good analogy, yes sir. Okay, I don't I don't necessarily see that from a from a scriptural standpoint. Right. But what I what I want is to step back, and I, I love how Apostle paints that picture. So when you think about it, Luke is the only gospel that talks about the two cups. So think about this: these are different accounts by different writers. Luke picks up the second cup. John picks up out came blood and water. I think it's really important for us to understand is that when you look at the, the gospel of Luke, Luke is actually interviewing. So John's an eyewitness and you hear me say this all the time. He's an eyewitness and he's an ear witness. John was actually there at the crucifixion. So remember when Jesus is crucified, he actually tells John, take care of my mom. Yeah. He has this poignant moment with John. So John would have been there and witnessed this. Luke is as this physician and really does some investigating. So Luke knows Peter. He knows the early apostles. He's actually gone with Paul on missionary journeys. So when you look at his account, he's getting eyewitness account also of what happened. It's ironic that he's the one who captures the two cups. And so I love your analogy of apostle. He clicked, basically the table is cleared off. Jesus actually institutes what we would call the Lord's Supper at that moment. And here's something different for us, that if you're new to us, if you come and you're a part of our service this week, um, you won't see us with grape juice. You won't see us with wine. You will actually see our representation or what becomes the blood of Jesus. We utilize water. And so as Apostle said, it was a New Testament in my blood. We go to John 19, 34, when he pierced, out came blood and water. Uh, and so, again, I think that's important as you understand why we do what we do here in the house of God and why we use water for communion. And I think Sister Prophetess Richardson, she put that in the chat, but we just wanted to make sure our people understand that. Right. All right. Any other questions? I know this is a lot. And so here's what we would say. Apostle and I talked about this. And, um, you know, the reality is a lot of times we wait until Passover to talk about Passover. But we really wanted to make sure uh, that we really spent time going through things. So when we come into the Passover... Um, that our hearts, our minds are ready to receive. So we'll stop right here for questions. And then, Apostle, I want to answer the two questions that we got from uh, people in the Bible class and really give some understanding on those questions. So any other questions? Not a question, but a comment. So uh -huh. this, this is a lot. And I'm, I'm struggling with, I don't even know how to frame some of the questions that I have because it really is, it's a lot. And it's all good, um, but it's not recorded in a way so that those of us who might need to hear something repeated can go back and sort of listen again. 
So one of one of my suggestions for next year is perhaps if we did it on Facebook so that it would be something we could revisit over and over. What I have found is that I, I'm the kind of learner that I sometimes need to hear something two or three times. I need to have my Bible open. I need to go back and reflect on it again and think about it. And, and Zoom doesn't really afford us that opportunity. I know that these sessions are archived, but they're not archived in a way that allows us to go back and sort of, let me play take number two, because that's the day that I think I missed it. So I, I really appreciate everything that I'm hearing, but I, it is a lot. It is a lot. And I think you know, at the end of the day, um, I know that Easter is wrong. And so Passover has got to be right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but I don't want that to be how I respond to others, right? I, I, I want to be able, but I also don't want to overwhelm them with like this, you know, wealth and breadth of information because that too can sort of turn people off. But I don't know that I feel solid enough to be able to explain it to someone else who might approach me and ask questions. So that that's just my commentary. Sister Fro, thank you for that feedback. And I think one of the things we've got to think about is how do we how do we get these in bite-sized chunks? And I know Sister Ron is doing some editing on the back end of this. And uh, if she wants to come off mute, she can share. But yeah, I, agree, I agree with you on that from the standpoint of um, we give a lot. And I think Apostle Raglan, I remember when I first joined the church, um, he gave me this analogy because when I first joined the church, I was a zealot and I had everyone, <laughs> I wanted everyone to be in the church on the Sabbath and keeping the feasts and all that. And one of the things he said to me is um, sometimes, if, if, have you ever been in a room and someone turns the light on <laughs> and your light is too bright? He said, sometimes you got to dim your light a little bit. And so I think one of the things that we will work on trying to do, and Ron, if, if I'm misspeaking on what you're doing on the back end, you are come off mute. We want to try and put this in a format where people can go look at it, ask questions and go from there, because we really want to make sure people understand that. Yeah, that's correct. Um, there have been uh, some requests because this is such good information um, that we, you know, it's easier, like Sister Barlow said, to hear it over and over again so that we can get it in our minds and get our understanding. Some of these things that we've been taught over the years, that's why we know them so well. We've been taught them over and over and over again. So um, yeah, that's what I'm doing, taking these Bible study sessions that we've had, uh, we've been having, um, editing them, because I know some people don't want their um, their face to be shown, and I don't want your phone numbers out there or even your name. Some people may not care, but I do want to respect that, uh, the, the, as much of the anonymity as I can. And um, Apostle and uh, Deacon Preston will be looking over them, and uh, you know we'll be adding his slides in or any other information that he would like to, because not only do we want to um, see it, review it, understand it, we want others to, that you know, may be looking at it from wherever they are and don't have any understanding, never even heard of the House of God, just stumble over a YouTube channel and be like, oh, wow, you know, and not be offended and learn something from it. So, yeah, that's what we're doing. Got it. And so, if I just uh, follow, I hope that asked your question. Yes, we are. Unlike most of our Bible studies or, or Monday night or Friday night, every once in a while we do record. We always record, but we record for publish, for, for the purpose of publishing. Um, most are not. This one is. So, but we're not going to publish it like everybody's comments, everybody's information. So, uh, Sister Ron and her team, they're editing, I guess, most of her editing these, these um, study sessions. So, they will be made available to you. Thank you, sir. I, I, I can't say enough about how much I appreciate all of the hard work that Sister Rhonda and Brenda do and others who may be on your tech team. And I mean, to have leaders like you all who want us to understand and who are yes. willing to navigate, I, I just appreciate that so much. And I just have one other comment and that is, you know, for years you celebrate, the, for me, celebrated the Passover and the focus was always on natural Israel and what was happening with the plagues and all, all of this focus on that instead of the focus being on the blood, right? And so yes. it's the blood that atoned for my sin, it, that's the part that, that's going to be the selling point for me to share with others concerning the Passover. It's not so much about what happened with Israel, especially if people don't identify as Israel. They weren't, you know, that wasn't them. And so to, to, to be able to 
sell this to others, not that God's word needs to be sold, but, but to be able to share it with others and frame it around, this is a celebration of the blood. This is a celebration of the blood that Christ shed for us at Calvary. Yeah. It's a, it's um, a can I throw a plug in for the tech team? So We're powerful. looking for volunteers. <laughs> what was that, Rod? I said, plug for the tech team. We are looking for volunteers, dedicated <laughs> volunteers. <laughs> yeah. All right. I see Sister Joan Christmas has her hand, and then we want to go into the two questions that we've got from our audience. Sister Joan? Okay. Good evening. I, um, um, I need a scripture that tells me that the Passover was killed in the midst of the week. Is there a scripture? Okay. Now, I can, I know when he rose. Okay. I know that scripture when it began to draw on toward the first day of the week. Okay. And I can back it up three full days and three nights. Yep. Okay. I read Daniel 9 and 27 and it just totally confused me and I didn't understand. Okay. Yep. So what I, wanna, what I want to know is is there a script, one scripture? If not, then of course, then what I will have to do is I will have to get scriptures together. And with getting those scriptures together, I'll be able to come with a response and answer. Yeah, sure. bigger person yeah. yeah, so here's the thing. If you most people will anchor to, and I anchor to when you think about what was going on, Daniel's prophecy and Daniel's correlation with Revelation. Uh, most people would say that Daniel 9, 27, and depending on what version you're reading, Sister Joan, it can be really confusing. But when you really look at that and do the analysis of it, what Daniel was saying is that the sacrifice is going to cease. And so the reality with that is when Jesus was actually crucified, all sacrifices from, from my understanding all would have ceased. So think about blood sacrifices ended. That's what the book of Hebrews talks about. No longer did they offer bull and, and goats and all these things. So Daniel 9 and 27 is really saying when this sacrifice occurs, and he says this sacrifice will occur in the midst of the week. And that's why, as I look at that scripture, I utilize that to say that would have foreshadowed Christ. That would have happened in the midst of the week. And that's where we get to what I would say when you look at the midst of the week Wednesday, others may not agree with that. Uh, but again, I, I think without that, you can go back and you can look at AD. There, there are people who've gone back, Sister Joan, and have actually looked at AD 33, the year of AD 33, when the Passover actually happened. And that historical research indicates the Passover probably would have happened on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and people will utilize that research as well. And then, you know, Sister Joan, let me just read part of that 27. Uh, day 927. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. One week, right? What's a week? When does now it could in the seven days is a week, but on our calendar, a week is from Sunday to Saturday. So he's going to confirm it of um with with one week, right? And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice in the oblation to cease. Think about this. Now, we don't do this, but in the, in the religious world, they go from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. That's more than a week. So we know that the scripture tells us that he entered into the city on the first day of the week. That's right. Right? So that's the week it's talking about. The week that he was crucified, he entered into this, that city on the first day of the week, and it was for a whole week, and it ceased in the midst of the week when he was crucified, because what we know is at the end of the week, at the, uh, towards the going down of the sun, on, on the Sabbath, he rose. If you take it further than that, then, then it makes that scripture false. Yeah. But yeah, Sister Joan, if, if you're looking for something that would specifically say Wednesday, you're not going to find that in the scripture. Um, no, what it said the fourth day of the week, Joan. So. Stop. But, <laughs> hey. Okay, okay, because I come in contact with some people and I want to be able, and some of the people 
or some of my family members, I, I want to be able to explain to them, okay? As I said, I can back it up to the midst of the week, right? but I'm, I'm looking for a scripture. Oh, I'll tell you what I need to do. I need to look at da Daniel 9 and 27 more. But let me say this, Joe, before you do that, you're dealing with people that may not understand this. Don't go to Daniel 9, 27. When I'm trying to explain the, um, the crucifixion, I don't go to Daniel 9, 27. Guess what I do? I did the first thing you said you do. I back it up. Okay, that's what I did. Okay. When you back it up, it's going to put you um, on Wednesday. Right. But okay. just going to Daniel 9, 27, it's kind of, a, to me, it's a supporting scripture, but it's not the one that I would use to try to help somebody to understand the midst of the week. Okay. Yeah, and that's a good point, Apostle. I rarely go to 9 and 27 unless I I'm don't. dealing. <laughs> you know, I only you go there with people yeah. who know about it. Yeah. I do not take new people there. Yeah. Right, because, <laughs> you know, even with new people, new people could be people that have been around for a long time but not know anything about the word. It's they like could still saying. be new people. And yeah. I would not do that to them because it'd be too confusing. Okay. Yeah, I think the other thing, though, and we brought this out last time we had Bible study, I think this is probably one of the, this season is where um, people who don't recognize the seventh day Sabbath, when they read the scripture, will have to come to the reckon, uh, realization that when they say, is it don't, began to dawn toward the first day of the week, uh, when the Sabbath had passed, and they recognize, wait a minute, the Sabbath has passed. I believe he rose on Sunday. So what day is actually the Sabbath? It has to be Saturday. So again, from there, and then you take them back, it helps with one, showing people the seven-day Sabbath, because that's very clear in these resurrection um, scriptures, uh, crucifixion, resurrection scriptures, and then you can back them up to when he was actually crucified. So that's what I've done with people in the past. Uh, and then it just sometimes it clicks and sometimes they're like, OK, I never saw that. And then we move them from there. So great one other thing, Deacon Preston, is that we have to recognize that people today are not celebrating Sunday as a Sabbath. That's right. They're celebrating. If you talk to them, they'll let you know we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ. That's right. Now, when they find out the resurrection was not on Sunday, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to handle it then. But most people will tell you that Sunday it's the Lord's day, not the Sabbath. It's the Lord's day that we acknowledge the resurrection. So um, when people who understand the difference between Sabbath and Sunday, they will tell you very quickly, we're celebrating his resurrection. And don't you want to celebrate the resurrection of the Christ? I do. Mm -hmm. But not the way they're presenting it. Yeah, so I want to deal with two questions. So we got this question in, Apostle, and the question was, um, the position on, on your job is a lead position, and one of your duties is to set up special events or projects that come up. Um, and, you know, it, the following, you have to set up for something like Easter or Christmas, and you're given instructions to set those things up for those events. So I'm working on my job, and, you know, part of my job is I'm over something, and I've got to set up for these holidays. What should I do? Do your job. <laughs> Wait a minute. All right. All right. But that's a, from my understanding, that's a pagan festival. It is. You, I'm, not, we, I'm not observing. We, we just I'm spent five weeks speaking, speaking against it, right? So you're, what I'm hearing you say is I need to do my job. Yeah. You, that, that's the job you're hired to do is set up. You know, the thing is, let me just say this. If you were working in a factory and you were, manufacturing something when the end user of whatever it is that you are manufacturing you don't know how they're using it that's right let me give an example if you're manufacturing c and d cell batteries <laughs> you don't know how those batteries are used or what they're used in they can probably have a blank look on your face with you, so I never know, with you, I never know where you're going. So I'm gonna I'm go to the there. next question. I'm gonna leave it there because I want people to understand your job. Um, and then you, you do your job, and if you're not you're not comfortable with it, just ask God to move you from that and move you to something better. 
You see what I'm saying? God not gonna let us stay in something we're not comfortable with. And I can understand, and I know who asked the question, you and I talked about it. But the thing is, when if you in, in management, you in leadership, that's a whole lot of things that are required of you that you got to learn. Uh, now, now Rishon. <laughs> Hey, you know what some people do with them batteries too, but anyhow, uh, I, I'm gonna let you talk in a minute, Mr. West. But let me just say what I'm saying is that uh, that you can take a position. You can. You don't have to do it at all, okay? But let me just say this: when that's your job, you have a, a choice. And a good question: where do you draw the line? You have a choice to say that my commitment won't allow me to do this. So I'm going to leave the job and trust God that he will give you something else. Now, you can do that. And, or you can present it to them. Look, I can get people. I can do this. I can um, set it up. I can get people in line to do this. First of all, I'm not going to be there, but I can, I can get other people to do it. There are so many ways to work around. You got to be creative in working around things. Yeah. Joan got a hand up and I got to hear from uh, Minister West. Okay. Um, actually, I have been in those uh, type of situations before when uh, I was in a management position. I was there. And you're right, Apostle James. You got to be creative about certain things. You, you have to know. Actually, you have to know how far to go and, you know, and when to stop. And one thing that I was doing I was kind of making sure that I was the person, for instance, let's say we're going to have a, a luncheon, okay? I was the person that was in charge of the food because if I was in charge of the food, then I knew we weren't going to have any unclean food. You see, you see where I'm going with this. Right. And like, for, and like, for instance, if there was like a holiday celebration or like decoration of doors or offices or whatever, you know, I didn't take a part of that. I just gave other people the permission to do whatever it is they want to do. They but already got somebody that want to get out of work. Right. And stop. As long as they don't decorate my door. You see, it's, yeah. you know, and you're right. You have to be very creative in how to do this, you know, but uh, as I said, I have been in that position before and I believe I came out okay. And I don't believe God will let you stay in anything that you are, you're not comfortable with. Exactly. And that's my position. You know, my real position is that whatever position you take and how you handle it, God knows your heart and he knows that you don't want to be in that. Uh, even though that may seem to be your job, God got many jobs in the same company. He got jobs uh, other places that he will, he will make a way for you. He will provide a way of escape. Yeah. I see we got Mr. West. Yeah, we got Minister West out here. Any thoughts, Minister West? Oh, he don't put his thoughts in there. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I didn't. I really didn't have uh, a thought on it per se. I just, I just wanted something more detailed for for others. Um, yeah. I agree with what you said. You know, God will uh, provide a way of escape. I just think we have to. There has to be a line. I think uh, your relationship with. God and your knowledge of his word will also define your personal convictions. Um, but, you know, you, I, I don't think we can say, oh, well, as long as you're not partaking in it, you know, if that's the case, I can say, well, I'm going to be a bouncer at a strip club. As long as I don't look inside. You ain't big enough. <laughs> as, as long, but, you know, so I think there has to be a line. I think uh, your relationship with God and, and knowledge of the word is. will determine that. Also, that's I know that God will, you know, I've been in so many situations where, you know, uh, I, I remember one of my first jobs, you know, I, I told them I couldn't work on a Sabbath. And after 10 weeks of training, everybody, everybody works Saturday and you get one day off during the week. I told the manager, I can't do it. I prayed on it. He pulled me to the side and said, hey, you've got Saturday and Sundays off. Um, I've been in a situation where I was in an interview and told him about the fees days and all that because there was some some work on the weekends. And um they hired me, come to find out the owner was, he was Jew, his wife was Catholic, he knew all about the fees days and stuff. So 
I really do believe God will provide I do too. Uh, I really and do. there'll be workarounds. People will make accommodations and exceptions for you. Um, but you, you have to, you have to uh, stand your ground as well. Yep. You know, you may have to set up for the Easter, but don't go on a news station promoting Damn. that uh, this is the Lord's holiday. So that, that's my piece on it. And you're so right, uh, brother. I just want to give you a chance to speak, but you're right. This is the thing. God knows uh, how he knows our desire and you have to know where you stand with your commitment. You know, you, if you make a, a statement that, look, I'm not doing this. What, what do you say I'm being prepared for? I'm, in, I'm being prepared to be terminated. Now, if you are there, if you are prepared for that, then must do that. Go ahead and do it. But if your faith is kind of wavering, I trust God, but I don't want to, you know, miss the paycheck, da, da, da. You have to know where you are. And as a church, I think so many times we tell people, well, just do this and just do the other. And most of the churches, when you say, hey, I didn't get paid this week, they can look at you and go, oh, really? Oh, I feel so badly for you. You know, when the church gets to position that when you get fired, that they're going to take care of your paycheck for the, until you find another job, then they can tell you what to do. Until then, they got to say, we support you. We're here praying for you. We love you. If your faith is that strong, then step out of it on faith, and we could be right there with you praying and fasting. Hmm. All right, so that was question one. <laughs> Good conversation on that one. Question two, uh, the scapegoat in Leviticus chapter 16, 10 through 26 was, was it a foreshadow of Jesus bearing our sins on the cross? And why was it let go into the wilderness? And so the question on Leviticus chapter 16, and I appreciate the question. So I'll start, Apostle, if that's okay with you, and then Please. I'll give it over to you. So when you think about, if you were to go to Leviticus chapter 16, I think, uh, what you will find is, I think, and I'm just going to go to it quickly, I think that's the scripture where, um, you know, the Lord talks about, Aaron's sons have been killed. They've offered strange fire. And then we're going into um, we're going into the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, what happens is there's this offering. And typically, the sin offering is was one. So you've got to go to Leviticus chapter 4, and you've got to think about the sin offering. In Leviticus chapter 16, what's happening is you're having the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, he actually, rather than one goat, uh, he actually, uh, the priest had to pick two goats. One goat was actually killed. That blood was sprinkled on, uh, in, on the altar. And then another goat was, and so that first goat was cleansing, really part of a cleansing process. The second goat, um, Aaron prayed over and put the sins of the people on that goat. And that goat was taken outside the camp. And so what, in my viewpoint, both the goats are representatives because they were, one was cleansing and one was actually cleansing the sanctuary. The other one was actually taking away the sins of the people. Now, what you will read sometimes in that goat in the Hebrew, you'll hear people say Azazel or that represents Satan. I don't believe that. Satan can never be part of the redemptive process of God's people and, and bringing them closer to God. So I do believe that those goats were a foreshadow from the standpoint of what Christ did um, on the cross. What happens is, again, one was cleansing for the temple. The other one was removing the sins away from Israel on an annual basis. And that's how I saw those two goats in Leviticus 16, Apostles. So any, any area you no, want to clean me up on that? Great job. I just want to say this when it comes down to the actual feast days. You mentioned the Day of Atonement. Uh -huh. uh, the, the Day of Atonement, um, you know, we, we go through it each year and it's a memorial, but the, the atoning, actual atoning piece did not take place until Passover. Mm -hmm. that's right. And that's where you, that's where the question she's asking about, uh, I think Evangelist Williams asked the question, and I'm not sure she's on tonight or not. And, and Evangelist, you're on. If you want to come off a of mute and share, because the, the, the thing, what we recognize that Deacon Preston is saying, that was a purpose for these two goats. But they were two, um, Deacon Allen was trying to bring this up. He did bring it up last Friday night, and I accused him of being on medication because he had just had surgery. But I knew what he was saying. He was saying, what he was saying was something very, very similar. But 
If you can understand it, fine. But I don't want people to confuse the two feast days. That's right. That's all I'm saying. Yes, Jesus took away the sins. He shed his blood, his own blood, to take away the sins of the world. And in all sins, we can cast upon him because um, he has atoned for our sins, but not to the point that they're the same feast day. I think those who are who study God's word may get that understanding, but for the the novice or the person who may not have that in-depth thought process, it may be more confusing for them. And that's why I don't I don't bring the two together. But I can answer your question by saying yes, Jesus, there was no need for the escape goat anymore, or no need for any other goat being laid on the altar or going out in, in on outside the camp because Jesus took care of all of it. Well, again, if, if, if the next time she's on, I, I want to make sure we answer that question. And I know we're at, at time. And, and what I would say, and then I'll give it over to you, Apostle. Um, one, we've really tried to just make sure what we get in our hearts and minds, right, as we enter into the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is just a special season for God's people. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we've gone over a lot of information. But the reality for us is I would ask, do we personally know Jesus Christ in the pardoning of our sins? Yeah. And the reality, I, I don't get caught up in doc Jesus isn't about doctrine or, or this day or that day. And right. sometimes we can get caught up in those things. But do we know Jesus? And that's the call that we have for people is we like to have this knowledge. But the reality of it, of it is if this knowledge does not draw you to Jesus, the way you give your life to Christ, and you have a personal and intimate relationship with him, then we just got a whole lot of knowledge. And our desire is that we bring people to Jesus Christ. I'll say this. I was doing a Bible study today and, and listening to a pastor. And I think one of the most amazing things I think about when Jesus was crucified is on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. At a time in great agony, in a time when he was losing his life, when his disciples had abandoned him, where people were mocking him, where he had been scourged and his back must have been, uh, his back was bleeding. He was in agony and pain. He lived out his mission. He had told his disciples, this is, this is love. It's one thing to talk about love with your mouth. It's another thing to talk about it with an action. And Jesus did it in action. He got on the cross for me and for you. And as we enter into this Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread season, let's never forget what Jesus did for us on the cross. And our desire is that you would have a personal and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. So with that, Apostle, I'm going to put it in your hands. Thank you, Deacon Preston. Again, I want to say thank you for putting together the series. Uh, I, I know it was an, uh, enlightening for all of us to go through this. And I uh, think what uh, uh, Evangelist Follow has said, many of our churches, they emphasize Passover, Feast of Eleven Bread, and they emphasize, you know, uh, <laughs> the song that is sung during this feast, and I love to hear it, but I can't stay in the wilderness. I can't go back to the wilderness every year. You know, not that I won't sing it, but uh, <laughs> I just... Um, I'm not going back and relive that every year. People do it. I don't condemn them. I'm just talking about me. I'm free. Now, we need to know the history. We need to know what happened to Israel um, in that first Passover. And it, so every, even in our Bible studies are in the Sabbath school book, one year may, you may see an emphasis on um, the first Passover in Egypt. The next year, you might see it on Jesus, but I just trust that we land where Deacon Preston was just talking about. It. We land on that fact that Jesus is our Passover. Uh, and then and it spells out very, very clearly that he became our Passover when he gave up and he shed his blood. So uh, I'm, I will say this, that you might be in the middle of, a, of the Passover service and a question hits you. That's okay. Write it down. And we'll still talk about it. Um, with that said, thank you, Sister Rhonda, for putting together this. When it's done, we'll tell you um, how you can get the information. And and I don't know what do you plan to put this on YouTube, Sister Rhonda? Yes. All right. So when it's when it's ready, uh, we'll let the saints know it'll be available on YouTube. You can look at it. You can go over it, and you can share it with others. 
And we just think that we pray that this uh, will draw people to the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. So with that being said, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we'll absent one from another. In Jesus' name, amen.